Okay. Welcome to the Sumer Sports Show. I'm Eric Eager. Thomas Dimitrov is here, and we had him on camera. <laughs> now we have him back. Okay. Thomas is back. Uh, Thomas is on a little bit of a vacation, but because this show we know uh, means so much to our listeners, he is here, uh, Arkansas, right? You're you're in Arkansas? I'm in a place called Bentonville, Arkansas, for any of you mountain bikers. It's like one of the mountain bike meccas of the world, believe it or not. I know everyone thinks west, west, west. This is where the, the uh, Walmart uh, headquarters are, and the, the two grandsons have put hundreds of millions of dollars into this city and the infrastructure and uh i'm involved in it on a board with people for bikes which is a great nonprofit. and i just figured i needed three days to get away so i jumped over here at an 11 hour drive over here and uh start a couple uh parts of the symposium tomorrow but i'm here and just finished the ride and, and uh got in here so thanks for the delay i really really appreciate it i'm glad i'm on i'm glad i'm on I well, it, we obviously it's been uh, you know I miss talking to you, but I I know you're you're getting to spend some time with your family, which is great. And uh, if anybody knows, like obviously it was you know a, a summer where you didn't get to do that as much. Yeah. So uh, we obviously uh, are, are appreciate uh, your time whenever we can get it. Uh, I by the way was sick as hell this weekend with the flu, and so I got on my bike I think Saturday. And just biked up to like the gym so I could get like an eucalyptus. And I gotta tell you, Thomas, it was like a 1.5 mile ride. And I I I was not I was dead. I think I'm gonna be a little bit better today after we get done with the show. I'm gonna try to get a few more miles in. Um, but but yeah, it, it feels good. And and I gotta tell you, Atlanta, uh, I certainly traded up in in terms of October biking. Uh the weather here is phenomenal. Um, can't complain much. Um by the way, people who can complain, we were talking about this before uh, we got on. Um, we're not going to go through the Patriots Raiders game in depth, but I got to tell you that safety that Mac Jones took cost a lot of people a lot of money. For anybody who didn't know, um, that point spread was three. They were down by two. They got the ball. They completed a pass penalty, delay a game penalty. He takes the safety. They lose by four. A lot of money changed hands on that particular play. Um, that one was a really interesting one, Thomas. Uh, just a brief, like, if you're in Patriots land right now, you're sitting there at one and five. Your only win was against the Jets team reeling after the loss of Aaron Rodgers. Uh, I don't know if it gets much easier um, for, uh, you know, for anybody here moving forward. Well, I, I was watching that time and again, Bill tossing the iPad, and I was thinking, Oh man, I just, it's, it's gotta be tough over there, but I keep saying wherever bill ends up again, I, I, whatever it is, or that's not even the point here is like, it's going to be interesting to see how everything starts playing out. What are we six games in? And there's all this talk about changing of jobs and hot seat like every year. Right. But the fact that someone like bill is being even talked about where he's going to end up next year, or if he stays, it's to me, it's unbelievable. Have you been watching? Have there been comments from a lot of the big media? So, like, has Eric Mangini made any mentions about his past boss? You know, some of these people that are doing stuff, uh, uh, Tannenbaum, who's out there making comments about Bill, quite honestly? Or well, even I Michael know. Lombardi, who I know, you know, yep. is his biggest confidant, has had a lot of stuff to say. In fact, Michael Lombardi got a lot of flack today, and I gave him some, frankly. He wrote an article about the Panthers and David Tepper and – and I think we'll talk about that a little bit on Wednesday, uh, you know, uh, where, you know, it, it's been reported. I don't I, I can't confirm it, but like that he wanted Bryce Young and maybe the coaching staff and scouts didn't necessarily want Bryce Young. And Michael Lombardi, like chalked that up to analytics and said analytics are the problem. And the fact that he's a finance guy, when in reality, like the issue is the ownership meddling and what what are you willing to deal with there? But like Mike, it, it is interesting because I do think on this podcast, and you have a ton of admiration for Bill Belichick. I think yeah. you 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 stated that a number of times. I think you're you have been the only one that's actually been willing to sort of cross the line and say, "Is this the end for him?" I think a lot of people are toe tapping around that, and I, I I'm interested to go back. I've I've I've. I do read a lot of old newspaper clippings just so I can get an idea. And you probably understand that that's how I get a lot of the context that I get. I kind of want to go back and read about how 
people in Dallas were talking about Tom Landry mm -hmm. when Jimmy Johnson or when Jerry Jones, I'm sorry, bought the team. I kind of want to go back and and read about how people wrote about Chuck Knoll in the in the early 90s when they replaced him with Bill Cowher. Mm -hmm. I, it, and Don Shula, they, now they were Don Shula with Jimmy Johnson. Interestingly, like I think it, I think it's interesting because it's very clearly not working in New England anymore. And what I think is worrisome is I don't know if there's any way out. Like I don't see like they get another quarterback in here. That's great. I, I just, but I don't think he has weapons. Like. Mac Jones threw a perfect pass. Actually, he was a really good, um, you know, here by Mass. Devontae Parker, like, he threw yeah. a perfect pass on the sideline to Devontae Parker. The guy dropped it. Mm -hmm. And not to say Mac Jones has been good or perfect or anything, but, like, there's this – that roster doesn't have a ton of talent. And I wonder, does he have the patience? Or if he is truly chasing, like, this wins record, should he just go to a place that will – like, much like Kansas City with Andy Reid and open their arms to him and he can start winning games again? Look, that's what I'm saying. You you mentioned a few minutes earlier in your in your discussion. Absolutely don't think it's the end for Bill Belichick. Again, whether he stays there or whether he goes somewhere else, how, this guy is about history, right? He's about he is one of the best ever to coach it. And I think the most I've said that before. You guys get sick and tired of me saying it. He goes somewhere or there. He's going to finish and and you know accomplish what he wants to accomplish. I believe. <laughs> record wise. And obviously things are going awry right now, but uh, I just don't see, I don't see it being the end for him. I think he's got so much to offer. I told you guys, when you see him at the ownership meetings and he steps into those meetings with all the GMs and all the head coaches, he is the dude, right? Still sharper than ever, still on top of everything. And uh, you know, look, there's a lot still to give back to the NFL. And I think he's, 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 He's going to be focused to do so. It's just, it's tough to see that right now. No one feels sorry for Bill. You know that. I mean, we tons of money and accomplished so many things. It's just a matter of how it all plays out. So I know we don't want to stay on that topic all day, but um, it, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of hot seat action all over the country right now. Yeah, for sure. And and two teams that don't have coaches on the hot seat, but interestingly, I did want to, to highlight this. Beat Gamer 99, one of our frequent listeners, says, I liked your article about Schwartz. My only problem is I feel like owners are hesitant to hire former head coaches, plus DCs aren't the hot ticket item. Um, if you do go to, to uh, sumersports.com here, our, our own TJ McCreet actually you know wrote a really nice article here uh, about uh, Jim Schwartz. Uh, here, if you look at the left, about how well he's doing. Now, TJ, actually very predictive, Thomas, wrote this last week before, uh, you know, the, the the display that we saw um, the other day by uh, by the Cleveland Browns defense, right? So that's the, the one place I do want to talk about because Cleveland, which is Belichick's old team, your old team as well, um, they, they went, you know, they opened up about three-point underdogs last week, uh, you know, on the look ahead. When Deshaun Watson, you know, was was yeah. learned to not have, you know, his faculties, they got all the way out to a 10-point underdog at home against the San Francisco 49ers. Um, they got down, they got behind seven seven points early. But that defense, Thomas, was absolutely breathtaking yesterday. Uh, Miles Garrett, I mean, they 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 look at that team, and I think, you know, you look at you know, Andrew Barry, you look at, um, you know, that, that front office, that defense was its Achilles heel for a lot of the last few years. Mm -hmm. They go and they get, you know, guys like Dalvin Tomlinson to play the nose tackle. Um, they get uh, Juan Thornhill to play safety. They they built kind of that defense and, and they they really showcased Miles Garrett all around that defensive line and what it really did. That in addition to some injuries, we saw we lost, you know, we saw uh, Trent Williams go down, we saw Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel go down, but with a backup quarterback, in fact, a practice squad quarterback in P.J. Walker, they ended up winning that football game. Uh, that was one of the more surprising results that we've seen all season. And I think when you look at the 49ers running a little hot, right, I think mm -hmm. overestimating kind of what that those first bunch of wins meant for them against who they were against, uh, especially against a team like Dallas, who I think that they match up really well against. And Cleveland, you know, 
this is a season where maybe because of how bad quarterbacks have been across the board, Cleveland winning with defense, I don't know if it's a flash in the pan the way it would be in, in previous years. Yeah, I mean, you, you've said a lot there, of course. When you start talking, and I know the who was the listener there that, that just mentioned Jim and not not going after D coordinators. Be, beat Gamer 99, yeah. yeah so, beat Gamer yeah. 99. Well, I'm, my thought on that is, yes, I understand, but the league is very cyclical. Just like the league is focused on some of the younger guys, there are guys like this, like Jim Schwartz, who is really, really intelligent and is a game planning phenom. He's going to go in and he's going to figure out, just like I think Dan Quinn does a lot of times, they're going to go in and figure out the nuances of the system, right? And I'm sure they came in, you know, came in with all of his knowledge and his understanding. And like you said, the defense just stood up and did their thing, which I thought was wildly impressive. I don't necessarily think a guy like Jim Schwartz, Schwartz doesn't ever get an opportunity or some of these D coordinators. I think the league and the owners are going to go through their time, right? They're going to look at some of the youthful guys and they're going to start realizing, well, wait a minute here. Let's take a deep breath here and let's go back to being and, and choosing the coach that we really think is best for our organization, our talent, our, you know, there's, there's so many things that are involved when you decide on a head coach and a guy like, a like, guy like Jim Schwartz, as smart as he is, I think Jim Schwartz, just like there's a number of these former head coaches that get another opportunity, they come back with so much more knowledge. And I think they can be really, really good for an organization that's pitter-pattered around with some of the younger guys. I'm not saying they're not good, but maybe that is, right? When we were in, when we were in Atlanta, Mike Smith, like I told you, a fantastic football coach, got us to a point we brought in Dan Quinn, of course, completely different personality. Owners will look at guys like whoever they have as their head coach, and if they're ever moving on, they can look at a guy like Jim Schwartz and say, all right, this guy's more established, really, really smart, and a game-planning phenom, get the right offensive mind in there. Just because he's not an offensive guy doesn't mean that they won't go after him. That's my take on it. I think there's going to be some really interesting guys up there and because I think people continue to take shots at some of these guys that don't have a lot of experience and they're not always working out. So that's my thought on it. Yeah, Mojol has a really good point here. D'Amico Ryan's the DC who became a Texans head coach. Texans are being very a very encouraging team right now. They they went ahead and beat a New Orleans Saints team that was favored uh, on the road against them yesterday, a team that many people thought was going to be in the playoffs. Um, they they downed them. Uh, they had a, they were very competitive last week in Atlanta as well. And, and, and I think with Jim Schwartz, Thomas, it's like that Detroit team that he took over was 0 and 16. And I think Rod Marinelli, good coach, right? But that team didn't necessarily have any talent. And then they get they get Stafford in the fold. They deal with a, a few injuries to Stafford um, in 0, 09 and 10. 2011, they're in the playoffs. They're competing. Uh, 2013 was kind of the end for him after they kind of faded down the stretch and that was when he got fired but then you look at Jim Caldwell took over for him and they made the playoffs in three out of four years he he built the talent up on that team and I, and I, he's never really gotten a shot after that he was very good with Philadelphia very instrumental in their Super Bowl run and so I think that um he, he's probably earned it if he wants it I think being a head coach is you know is is tough on defensive guys because I think that you know running a defense is sort of this special kind of like you know, get the dip in and, 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 you know, sort of, uh, you know, really dial in, uh, and it's sort of hard sometimes, but we saw it with Sean McDermott, who, uh, you know, is, is still doing a pretty good job as the Bills head coach, even though he's had to take over defensive play calling from Leslie Frazier. So I, I think that there's a shot there for sports. Yeah. And look, I, I mean, D'Amico is an interesting candidate, right? He's a guy that played there. The family loves him, right? The McNairs love him. The fact that he's there, He's a strong, he was a very strong underrepresented candidate who comes in as a f former player who has a really good understanding of, of yep. defense, of course, and get the right people in there. And I know, you know, they're going with a uh, uh, young Slowick, uh, Bob, Bob Slowick's son, who's the, the OC, young guy, and he's doing a solid job there. So, look, I think it just depends on the organization, right? I mean, I really do believe you, you really have to factor in a lot of different things. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, where, where that next wave of head coaches are going to be coming in this year, what, which is something that we do at Sumer, right? We're doing a lot yep. of background work on, you know, digging into all the data that we have out there to, to, you know, make some suggestions to some of the teams that are interested in asking us 
and inquiring with us, right? So you might want to comment a little bit on that because I think we can do some, you know, provide some really good information. Well, yeah, I think that that I think that that segues into this next game that I do want to talk about because we we do have two teams that played in Atlanta yesterday who are kind of in that realm, right? Where you look at Washington, where you know Ron Rivera is in year four, year th- the first three years has only netted one uh, you know one playoff berth and no winning seasons. Atlanta's on year three with with Arthur Smith and year three of Terry Fontenot. And you look at exactly that, Thomas, right? Like Washington, they go get Eric Bieniemy to kind of be, you know, not not to besmirch Ron Rivera at all, but like it looks like the 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 you know, heir apparent, the guy who has in you know per metrics that we you know I've I've shown off before has looked really good as a possible head coaching candidate. Arthur Smith was a guy who had similarly good uh, metrics when he was the offensive coordinator with Tennessee, elevating a team with kind of a middle of the pack quarterback in Ryan Tannehill, as you know. And, and Washington, you know, Washington was coming off of a 20 point loss to a previously winless Bears team. They go on the road. The Falcons just coming off of a, a two point win against a, a a Houston team that we just talked about that's kind of on the up and up. And it was just kind of a litany of mistakes for the Falcons. The Falcons outgained Washington by over 200 yards yesterday, Thomas. The uh, Sam Howell took five sacks. He's on pace to lead, the, you know, to set a record, Thomas, for the number of sacks taken by a quarterback uh, in an NFL season. And yet three interceptions by Desmond Ritter, um, you know, red zone trips that just didn't bear fruit. And now we're looking at a Falcons team that one of the easiest schedules in the NFL moving forward, but also one of the easiest schedules in the NFL to this point and they're just three and three, the same record that Washington has with a much tougher slate. This one, this game, I, I think could have taken the NFL in a number of different directions. And now you have, you know, question marks abounding for both teams. Yeah, let's let's talk uh, let's talk Washington for a minute. I mean, you have a you know obviously a new owner. You have you have a, a coach who has, as you had just mentioned, I mean, Ron, Ron's obviously a, a, a talented football coach, has coached for a long time in the league. Some people would argue otherwise, his his track record or lack of a track record, you know, for playoff games. But he's a football dude, right? He, he understands it. And then you get Martin Mayhew, who's a second-time GM. By the way, we've talked about this, right, where you get, you get general managers, and everyone always says that GMs don't get a second chance. He's one of the guys, along with, you know, Trent Baalke at Jacksonville who have gotten second chances. Now there's Trent starting to rock, right? Things are rolling down there in Jacksonville. You know, what's going on in, 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 in Washington and how are people going to approach? How is the new ownership going to approach, you know, what Martin does there, right? And, and Martin's a former player as well. Good guy, understands football. We've said this time and again, it's about the big decisions, however. And these new owners that come in with Magic Johnson, by the way, who's been pretty outspoken, what's going on there with this team. So it's, it'll be interesting to see, you know, when they start talking, I've even heard Bill's name, Bill goes up, you know, Bill Belichick going up to Washington, be the, to be the dude there, to be the czar there, you know, does, you know, how, how does that owner, you know, what does that owner Magic Johnson say? Like, look, and, and beyond, right. It's just, it will be interesting. Let's, we'll talk about Atlanta in a second, but what is your, what are your thoughts about Washington that way? Yeah, I mean, Mark Mayhew, right, was the starting cornerback on the last time the Washington te- football team won a Super Bowl, right? Josh Harris is the longtime fan of the team, right? So you can imagine all these feels, right, where similar to the D'Amico Ryans thing where it's like you're part of the history there. And yet when I think of it, it's interesting because you talk about Balky doing so well in Jacksonville. What's the what's the ingredient there? It's the quarterback. The quarterback overcomes so much, just like your time in Atlanta, where you made tons of moves. Your all your drafts generated a ton of value, but really Matt Ryan was the catalyst for a lot of that stuff. And you know, you look at them, you look at Washington. It's like what ha, what mired most of Dan Snyder's tenure there. It was the Bruce Smiths, the Deion Sanders, the um, you know, going after the Jeff Georges. It was the big name stuff, and yet like. One of the that that reports you're talking about, it's like bringing Bill Bell or bringing back Joe Gibbs was another example, right? Yeah. Where Washington just kind of they wanted to take the the um, the shortcut to the, the 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 winning, and it and it just never materialized. And I think to myself, I'm like, okay, well, what does this team really have to do to actually make it work? They they got to get a quarterback, and 
Sam Howell has been right. encouraging at times in a lot of stuff, but for the most part, his pocket presence isn't probably good enough to play. Right. And and it's just it's just gonna it's always gonna be this eight and eight three you know, three and three right now. It's always gonna be this eight and eight type of play, which is why they got off of Kirk Cousins, their last yeah. pretty good quarterback. It's why, you know, it's why, you know, they fired, uh, you know, Marty Schottenheimer after one year. Mm -hmm. It's 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 all this stuff. And I think to answer your question, I think Washington is trying to take a, a, a learn from the last 25 years approach to this whole thing. And, you know, maybe Bill's the answer, but it also feels like they're just trying to find the, the most well-rounded approach to the whole thing, which may or may not include him. But, you know, look, uh, we've talked about this as well. As a general manager, not only your ability to evaluate and as your group, right? I'm talking about the team building group. I'm talking about head coach and GM. You have to make the right decision with your quarterback. That's how you're judged. That's, I don't care how you look at it. You can have a badass defense. You can do whatever, do whatever. If you don't have the quarterback, to have a midline quarterback thinking that you're, that person's going to save jobs win games. That's not always, I mean, it happens every once in a while, but it's not long standing. I'm not, look, I love the way that Sam competes. I mean, he's a tough dude and he plays hard. You know, I have ties to North Carolina with my in-laws, so they're really big fans of his. I get that. The reality though is you as a general manager and a team builder, you have to make a strong decision. Are we truly going to hitch our wagons to you know, th those are the ones right now in the league. So who are they in the league right now? You could talk about Sam Howe, Desmond Ritter. Who else in the league are the guys that are kind of, you know, we're trying to figure out who they are. I mean. It doesn't last particularly long, right? Because doesn't. because if he plays, I mean, I get worried about this because I agree with you. I think Sam Howell is a is a backup quarterback that you, that if you're, is a backup quarterback on a Super Bowl team. To me, that's what he is because yeah. he comes in the game. He gives you a little bit of a spark. You're not, you know, Tyrod Taylor last night. I don't know if you watch Bill's Giants, but like Tyrod Taylor is that kind of quarterback that make gives you a respectable game when he has to start, but he's not going to, he's not going to win you a game as a backup. Sam Howell is a guy that can come in and win a game against any team in the NFL. He can also lose a game against any team in the NFL. And he's just, to me, he's not like consistent enough in the pocket to win with. And so you can't I, I just don't think it's tenable and then the, the bigger part is the risk the risk that he gives you a daniel jones type of year yeah. you make the playoffs you win a game you pay him 40 million dollars <laughs> and now your whole fan base is looking at over the cap.com seeing how when they can get out of that deal that's i think the worry whereas if you build it from the ground up you draft a guy like trevor lawrence high or you draft a guy you know like uh cj stroud high and you and you work with him then you can build it organically. And then when he's actually earned that contract, you're willing to say, okay, I'm going to give him the 40, 50 million a year because I can build around it. And it's a tried and true method. Everything else to me always feels a little bit band-aid-y. And then you're like, it, where, the, where the Vikings are, where it's just like, ugh, you know. Tennessee, like, I mean. Tennessee, I mean, uh, New York. Uh, I'm, you know, it, it, and, and you're right. Tennessee's another one where that coach, Rabel is so good. He can coach his way out of a paper bag, but it's like you're so limited by the quarterback play. And and, and so I, I feel like Washington has a perfect bridge quarterback, but don't let the success of that bridge quarterback week to week obscure the fact that you really need a real quarterback. And and we said this before, and, and not this is not picking on Desmond Ritter, because again, I hear people come, you know, talk about it outside, you know, within the building, and they're they they love that this kid, they think that he can get better. But back to, of course he can, you know, time, and time will tell. But, but to really hang on, you know, that's something that, you know, you're, you have to have a very, very sort of acute eye to say, like, let's, let's face the facts here. Is he the person that you're going to build with for years to come? So let's just go over to Atlanta. Or is he a person back to bridging? And, and how far do you bridge? How long does Arthur Blank want to bridge with a quarterback. That's not Arthur's makeup. And I, and I say it with all due respect. I mean, Arthur is a competitive dude. He put himself online, you know, you know, saying that this is the guy we are growing with into the future, because of course, you know, Arthur and, and Terry Fontenot have, have given him that as well as Rich McKay, I'm sure, because Rich is involved and that's a big thing for them, right? Let's keep going. And again, they have some talent on that team. They've done a nice job building around, but 
and you have to figure out how you're going to do it with this quarterback. When you watched that game with Desmond, were those interceptions in your mind catastrophic? Were they by virtue of being interceptions? Are you like, oh man, you can't have such a great game like the last, the game before Houston where he was just darting. And then all of a sudden come I back. made a tweet in the middle of the game and I, I tweeted something like, so this was halfway between where Washington had got a lead, but Atlanta was moving the ball pretty well. And I, I said, you know, he's been profoundly not bad the last game and a half. And then he threw one right to the free safeties chat. Like it, and there was one where they were down by eight and he, he just left it up there for the corner. It, it was, they were not great. And, and they were interceptions that weren't bad luck. They were truly limitation. They're interceptions that were a product of his limitations as a quarterback. And so I I think that if you're if you're Arthur Smith and you see it and you're like, I I I struggle and I, I'm not a coach. I've never coached yeah, before. Sure. But if I look at him and I say, you know, is it a cry? Is it a sin of commission or omission? It's a sin of omission. He doesn't have that. He doesn't have the arm strength to make the throw he tried to make in the end zone to uh, to Drake London for that that interception. And like so that's where I get worried. Right. Because if you're Arthur Smith, I think a lot of times you watch that tape and you're like, I can work with this. And then there are certain plays where you're like. He I, he can't run that offense. So uh, he can't run corners of that offense. He can run the fat of the offense. Right. The play for play stuff. For sure, and he's got some athletic ability. He ran for a touchdown, all this stuff. But it, it's there. There were limitations in his play yesterday that were glaring. And I think that if you are if you're Arthur Smith, you got to go back to the drawing board and paper over those. And the problem with the Falcons is this is a very easy schedule. I say this every yeah. single year, and and this was the year to get some wins on the board, right? You go seven and ten, seven and ten. You got to go ten and seven. So that your ownership is looking at you and saying this is going in the right direction, and and the the table was set for you to do that. If you go eight nine or seven and ten again, that is what I worry about for this for that regime because it was right there in front of them. Well, that that three and three situation, three and two on the way to four and two, or th- you know uh, three and three now, this is one of those situations. And I I don't want to answer for for Atlanta here, but I would just say. Times when I've been in that mode where it's kind of like you're right there, right? You're right at cutting time and you're like, uh, 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 you know, you you think about it. You talk about it with the owner and the owner says, OK, what are we doing? And you talk GM, head coach and owner. And you're 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 usually discussing when is the time when, you know, we have Tyler Heineke here, like where, you know, he's a competitive guy. Right. We've seen what he's done. He yeah. probably wanted nothing better. He's Sam Howell. He's, he's Sam Howell. Yeah. But. He's waiting. He's wondering what, where, where does the team like, think about that. Everyone, all the listeners think about that's not an easy spot to be in. Arthur Smith has been very outspoken that this is the dude we're going with. I get it. There also is a time. However, you got to sit back. You got to take a deep breath. You can't worry about what the media is saying or people like us are saying, you have to think what is best for the organization. And this is a tough time right now. Three and three. Do you want to go three and four, three, five, three, six, that's that's not where you want to be. So. Well, and you're worried. You're worried about this, and it, it, it's a modern problem, Thomas. Right? You didn't have this back in the day. I remember when you were on Cleveland. They went Kosar to Testaverde to to Rippin to, and they went back and forth. Nowadays, once you bench a quarterback, his job, his career as your quarterback, like Zach Wilson, when the when the Jets benched him last year, they made the decision to go with Rodgers the next year. Right? Yeah. Like you don't. And I think that their worry is, is if they give up on him too quickly, it's over for him. And now you've you've invested all this capital, both emotionally and from like a legit capital, like draft capital and stuff, on this quarterback, only to give up on him. And so it's a good question. You know, Atlanta this week uh, is in another game where they're basically, you know, it's basically a pick'em for them. And 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 so you know maybe they could go to four and three and everything's fine. Um, but. I think, you know, you start to get into that three and five, four and five, four and six range. I think that's when they're really going to start to ask questions about, have yeah. you really invested what you're supposed to in this position? Um, I'm looking right now, the Falcons go to Tampa Bay next week. Uh, they're two and a half point underdogs. Um, Tampa Bay just got beaten up pretty badly by mm-hmm. Detroit, you know, but Tampa's in first place in the division. If the Falcons win that game, right, and New Orleans plays on Thursday, Falcons win that game, they're in first place in the division. 
uh, at least tie with New Orleans. So maybe while they're they're <clears> always sort of in this, if we win this game, we're in first place in the division, they'll stick with with Ritter. But once they start to fall behind, maybe they go with Heineke, and maybe that ends up just being their approach here. Well, look, they, they have a lot on their minds for sure. And they're, you know, again, they have a good, you know, combination of players. They And and like I've said time and again, I think Arthur Smith is a really good head coach. I really do. And I think, you know, and and, and honestly, I, I, I like what their defensive staff is doing. You know, they're playing hard. Those guys are, are flying around. There's some players on there. I mean, you talk about a, a safety that when I watch him, man, he's just – I love the way that he's flying around making plays all the time as well. You know, they're, you know, look, I, I just think they have a side to them. Although Matt Ryan, before we move on, did Matt Ryan make a comment in the game about this being an undisciplined football team? Did you hear that? I, I didn't hear that just because I was kind of watching all the games at once. Okay. Um, but that's interesting. I, I didn't know Calais Campbell got his 100th career sack. Like he's been a veteran presence for them. Um but you're right about the defense. I mean, when you hold an NFL team under 200 yards, you've done a good job. And, well, and you know, I'm, I, but that's interesting that, that you would say that. I mean, like that, that does kind of coincide with some of the, you know, with some of the on field stuff that's gone wrong for them though. Yeah. And, and look, I, you know, this, we, we can stop talking about Atlanta right now, but the reality is now in my mind, I keep saying that the reality is they are in a still a sound place no one needs to panic. They just need, there needs to be no panicking out there by the fan base and the media. It's more watch closely how they approach this. And to your point, if it goes four and five wins, they'll settle in. If it goes the opposite way, it's going to be interesting to see how long it takes for them to uh, give, give Heineke a shot. Yeah, for sure. The last thing I want to talk about before I let you go, because I want to get you back on the bike here, the, the Bears lose at home to the Vikings. Justin Fields dislocates his thumb. They're now one in. They're now one in five. The Vikings move to two and four. Vikings weren't impressive either. The, these are two franchises where the general managers were hired at the same time. The coaches were hired at the same time. And you watch that game, and I got it. Like, I, I I want your opinion on this because it felt like a wake. Like I watched the game, and it just felt like it felt like. There were, it was, the vibes were so bad, right? And and you get this little Division II quarterback. He comes in, he lights a spark a little bit. But there was no – without Justin Jefferson, Kirk Cousins had no – he had no energy. It was – you know, and, and they weren't – and, you know, they they basically ran the ball to Alexander Madison um, the entire game as well. I, I watched that game and I'm thinking to myself, are these two regimes that two years in, a lot of excitement, Vikings 13 wins last year – the Bears, with all the excitement coming into this year, how do you reclaim any of that excitement now that two teams are kind of out of the playoff race and you know quarterbacks hurt on one side, the best player on the other team's hurt on the other side? Like, how do you rebound from this? This is tough, man. You, you know, let's let's step back a little bit here, and you know this name that I'm going to mention here, Kevin Warren. <clears throat> you know that name? Oh yeah, Big Ten so, commissioner for a while uh, during COVID. Yeah, that's right. Was with Minnesota forever. Was good friends with Rick Spielman, right? Those that well, whatever. I mean, I'm just saying he was there for quite a while with Rob Brzezinski and group. He takes over as the president. <coughs> excuse me. Um, after, <coughs> I'm so sorry. After the new regime took over, right? So this is his first year as a president. You don't think he has a ton on his on his plate? What does he do in this situation? I'm thinking it's completely. Um, you know, uh, the idea of concentrating on, on how they're going to deal with this. Are they going to make changes on the coaching staff, on the coordinator side? Do they go as much as making, making changes, you know, in Chicago at the head coaching spot? Is there also talk about management? And the only reason I bring that up is you have a guy like Kevin Warren. You don't think there is a ton on his plate. How does he make the right move? How does well, he... Well, and they're trying to get public financing for a new stadium outside right. of the historic Soldier Field. And yeah, you think about this on one side of the plate, Thomas. It it like I talk, we talked about the Cardinals last week. Currently, the Bears have the first pick, which is the Panthers pick, yeah. and they have another pick of their own in the top five. They're holding on to a quarterback that probably has some utility to another team. Like they could that could be a very attractive job to another general manager candidate. You're in the you know one of the three most popular you know you're the three most popular cities in the united states of america 
and you know and again a new stadium pot there's appetite for a new stadium in in at least among other owners like there's a lot of possibilities there but yet that's going to require moving off of people that you just hired a year and a half ago look i i think it's completely premature to think about even thinking about a change in the management i mean ryan poles good football man but he's got a lot of pressure on him right you know to make a move most general managers get an opportunity to hire two coaches most however we don't know the background right are things really all over the place right now given what was happening with the coach and all the stuff that was going on there I'm talking about the coach who uh, is no longer there. I forget his name. My, it's uh, Alan Williams. Alan Williams. There's just a lot going on. So sometimes, you know, the McCaskies, they're, they're you know, they, they care about perception. And so it, it'll be interesting to see with Kevin again, back to Kevin Warren, being close with the McCaskies and talking about what the next steps are. I'll be interested to see if there were to be a change at the coaching side. Again, I sometimes hate even talking about that. But if there were... And all of a sudden, Ryan Poles is in that spot where they're looking at a stud coach. I heard the same kind of thing about Washington with Bill Belichick, right? Historic team. Uh, that's a completely different situation. Ryan Poles, Bill Belichick is not ever, at least in my mind, is not ever going to another organization where he's not the dude there. So yeah. it, it just it's there's a lot on the plate there. Yeah, and we talk about, oh, my gosh, that team was down in the dumps. I mean, Bill Parcells took over a New England Patriots team that was about to move to St. Louis and and made that thing into a Super Bowl team. And then Bill obviously took over and made that thing into what it is now. Like, we think of these teams as immutable, but, no, every single franchise has had its, you know, ups and downs and, it, and, and uh, you know, will and could be attractive, right? We all thought that uh, Mike McCarthy was going to go to Pittsburgh because that's where he's from. But he ended up going to Dallas, a, a historic franchise in and of itself. So the, you know, like I said, I watched that game and I'm sad because I, I know, you know, I, I know most of the people in those buildings, and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself like there was so much excitement just a few weeks ago, and we're on this show, and again, I think this is a very, uh, uh, this is a very uh, prescient show. Like I'm saying to myself, I think expectations are too high on both sides. And, I, and I'm worried that on-field stuff is going to make people start to ask questions that either you should be asking now, which they weren't, or is an overreaction. And I think it's both, in, in both cases, an overreaction, both Minnesota's uh, struggle right. start as well as Chicago's. And I would just say this before we move on. I know we're going to be cutting it close uh, today, but the I think this is imperative for the owners if they're truly behind their guys they don't need to like assuage the the the, the um, uh, fan base, right? Come right damn out and uh, come out uh, and be very aggressive and say, look, this is these are the people we're staying with or not, right? Don't don't just kind of hang it over. That's just not the in my mind. Now I've been on both sides of it. You want your owner to be be behind you, right? You want him to be behind the head coach. They have not said anything, right? I haven't heard it on both sides. No. So, like, you know, is this going to be a situation that becomes much more like EPL, right? Where there's within 18 months, the people are turning over a lot quicker than they used to. Well, and that's never been the way in Minnesota, for example. I think uh, Leslie Frazier in my lifetime was the lowest, short, shortest tenured coach there at three years. Um, and I think for the Bears, in my short memory, I mean, Dicka was there forever. Dick Duran got his shot. You know, uh, uh, Wanstead got his shot. This would be for both franchises that played yesterday. This would be a a drastic change from what is usual uh, to move off of a, a coach or a regime that quickly. I think only Fran Foley Thomas got like less time, and that was because he forged kind of like his entire resume when he was uh, the triangle of authority with Childress and the Wills and him uh, back in 2006. So uh, interesting stuff. I think this is a perspective. By the way, we like to thank you all for for coming to the stream. A lot of support last week. I thought that I think the episodes have been wonderful. Can't wait to come back Wednesday and talk uh, about some other league topics. Um, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, tell somebody about the show. This is this is uh, one of my favorite things to do every single week. Uh, Thomas, any parting words? No, no parting words. I just want to say this. This is interesting. See this here? I, I was, yeah. This is called a monocle. Remember monocles back in the day when you were studying yeah, you, history? You put it. You put it on your eye. Yeah. Well, those of us who have glasses and we don't want to have glasses and we're out mountain biking or doing something physical, you can have this in your shirt. And if you have to check your your phone, 
and check and see that, hey, I'm a little bit late for the for the show. Can I and be able to type? It's just uh, the only reason I bring it up is because it's become kind of a hot thing now with it, with the uh, outdoorsy athletic types out there that can kind of uh, get themselves out of a bind. They don't have to care wear glasses all the time like you do. I uh, I one time my dad offered to pay for LASIK. I, I wore I didn't wear contact lenses for two weeks. I prepped for it and I chickened out. I think that that was one of the the uh, the uh, the the worst mistakes of my life. By the way, uh, I do actually um, remember the Les Steckel days. Les Steckel did own the the former uh, leader of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. That was a one year head coach for the Vikings in between Bud Grant and right before. Bud Grant had two tenures, and then uh, they went with Jerry Burns, who, by the way, is still the best quote in the history of the NFL. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for remembering to talk about the monocle. I completely <laughs> slipped my mind, um, at which 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 will surprise you. So uh, for Thomas Mitroff, for Eric Eager, this has been the Sumer Sports Show.